Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today I want to discuss two things that have to do with light. The first is something called diffraction and the second is something called refraction. And they affect the way that we see objects in our world. So let's cue up the music and have a look at light. When we talk about diffraction limits in science, we're talking about the Raleigh criterion, which is the diffraction limit of light passing through an aperture. In the human eye, the diffraction limit is about 25 arc seconds. Now recall that an arc minute of angle is 1 60th of a degree and 25 arc seconds will be about half of that. Now to give you an idea of what a minute of angle is, a minute of angle is 1.04 inches at 100 yards with an unaided eye. Now that is about the limit of what the human eye can resolve due to the arrangement of rods and cones in our eye, much like the sensor in a digital camera. However, if you look at it strictly from the aspect of the diffraction limit, we should be able to see two lights more than about half an inch apart and separate them out as two separate lights. Now, as it is, we can only do that at about an inch. But based on the physics of light, we could technically do it down to half an inch. So let's let Ranty continue. Two lights become one light, two bricks become one brick. And at a bigger and bigger distance, two trees become one tree and so forth. Now, one thing that I think it's very important to say is that the Raleigh criterion and the diffraction limit applies to the entire visible object from one side to the other. At no time would just the bottom of that tree disappear due to the Raleigh criterion. It's the distance from the bottom of the visible part of the tree to the top of the visible part of the tree. You don't subdivide that and try and make it go below the Raleigh criterion and then say you can't see it. Essentially, diffraction limit, um, when, when, when light passes through an aperture, we get a diffraction pattern. You know, the central disk of that we're going to call the area's disk. And we have these, these areas of uh, constructive and destructive interference around it. Light coming from any part of an object, any part of an object, not just the bottom, not just the top, but literally every single part of an object as it passes through the aperture is going to, is going to create one of those diffraction patterns. Now, if the diffraction patterns get so close that the first minima of one uh, lies underneath the <coughs> first minima of one, uh, underneath the maximum of the, the, the next one, then you can't resolve them. You can't tell them apart. You can't tell that those two objects are two objects anymore. They will appear as one object. Well, as suspected, Conspiracy Cat does indeed know what the Raleigh criterion is. And here we go right here. So we have two distinct lights forming two primary peaks. Now you see down there, they, they drop all the way to the baseline and then they go up to a little shoulder. That's called a secondary peak. And what we're demonstrating here is as those lights come together, it gets to the point where one primary peak falls directly on the secondary peak of the light source next to it. Then we can only distinguish one light source. Now, for example, if we had a 100 meter high building with a light on the bottom and a light on the top, how far away would that building have to be in order for us to not be able to distinguish that top light from the bottom light? There's the formula right there. Use a circular aperture. Now, for you geeks out there, let's say the pupil of your eye is five millimeters and an average of visible light is 500 nanometers. So it's going to be 1.22 times 500 nanometers over five millimeters. You'll need to use common, common units. And that equals the sine of that angle. Now, if you figure that out, it's going to come to 0 0.007 degrees. So it appears that he does indeed understand that two objects will appear as one object when the diffraction limit is reached and breached. So my question is a simple one, really, to you conspiracy cats. Where in your sphere mathematics 
is this accounted for? Now, this is a rather classic flat earth argument. Not understanding the Raleigh criteria, but knowing that the Raleigh criteria exists, flat earthers like to say that we aren't including the Raleigh criteria in the curve calculator, so therefore, how can it be real? Well, here, here's how it's real. The curve calculator is based on direct line of sight. Now, if you look out here and see where the visible is, that is the top and the bottom of the visible portion of the object. Now, in order for the Raleigh criteria to come into play, if that visible portion was 100 meters like our building, it would have to be 818 kilometers away before that angle dropped to 0 0.007. Even taking the diffraction limit of the human eye due to the sensitivity of the rods and cones, that would be well over 400 kilometers away. Yet due to earth curve, that object will disappear in 40 kilometers. So the diffraction limitation shows us how two objects appear as distinct objects or merge to one based on the distance and the angle between them. Now, one way of doing that is using something called a selenium eclipse. A selenium eclipse is an eclipsed moon that appears to be above the horizon with the sun being above the horizon as well. And it's due to refraction or the bending of light. Now, the actual position of the moon in a selenium eclipse is 180 degrees from the sun with the earth in between, which is why we're getting a lunar eclipse, the shadow of the earth is passing over the surface of the moon. However, due to refraction and bending of light in the atmosphere, an illusion of the moon being higher than it actually is allows us to see both the sun and the eclipsing moon above the horizon from our position on Earth. Now, the bending of this light with the moon is approximately 0.6 degrees or about one diameter of the moon. The same thing occurs on the sun as well. The sun appears to be a little higher on the horizon than it actually is. In reality, it's a little bit lower. And again, about one diameter of the actual sun. This is a cargo ship in Norway or Sweden. Now, what's going on in this particular photograph is they're beginning to have this temperature inversion effect where they've got very cold water, warm air above it, and a cold layer of air just above the sea. As you can see, you can recognize this as a ship. However, that's the same ship. So is that. And so is that. As you can tell, these ships look very different. And this one actually looks pretty small compared to, say, that one. These are the kind of tricks that this sort of temperature inversion and superior mirage can set up to the lookouts in the California. This is another example of a temperature inversion causing one of these superior mirages. Now, if you look at this particular photograph, you would think that this is some small land masses with some cliffs behind it. However, look at the symmetry right along this line right here. You see how these, these areas look like they're mirror images of each other? The cursor is moving along the actual horizon. This is a false horizon due to refraction. The true horizon is actually down here. Now here's the problem you can run into with this. As I said, this is approximately the level of the horizon. If you have an object sitting in the sea somewhere in this area, this false horizon that is well above it from the temperature inversion and the mirage may hide it. Now with superior mirages, you can get things such as a feta morigana, which is inverted most of the time as this is. You can get looming where this land down in this area can appear to be higher up in this area. Another form of a feta morigana that you can run into is something called a feta bromosa. A feta bromosa is also called fairy fog. And it is an illusion 
where right at the horizon, you can get some fuzziness and some brightness that looks like a fog bank that's not really there, but it makes the horizon very indistinct. You can't tell the difference between the sky and the sea. Now, in the evening, you can see something that looks like this. It's called a feta bromosia. This is the indistinct horizon. Notice that it is brighter than the sea, and it's very fuzzy and indistinct in this area here. If there is an object sitting on the sea in front of this, with this in the background, you may not see that object until you're almost on top of it. Here's a graphical example of the same thing. The mirage is basically curling up the horizon in the background, and it can hide an object such as an iceberg right in front of it. Now recently, we've seen these images, so let's have a quick look at them. I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, you see the very distinct horizon here? And look at the watercolor. You see how it's uniform? Now we'll also turn our attention to these two oil rigs. Do you see this platform or this walkway underneath the oil rig? And you see this flame boom coming out the side. Relatively straight, that's clearly visible. Here's another oil rig off in the distance beyond the horizon. You see the flame boom is nice and straight, and you don't see the walkway or anything under here. But let's look at this image. Now this image is interesting because, as you can see, the flame boom is very badly distorted over here. Same thing over here. We see the walkway, but this looks like it's stretched a little bit. We're starting to see the walkway right at the horizon here. And the interesting thing about this is the bottom of this oil rig below that walkway rail right there is behind the water. Notice the different colors of water here. We have dark blue, we have very light blue, and then back in here we have a haze. And it's very difficult to tell the difference between the sky here, the water down here, and then this layer right here. We're dealing with the exact same effect, and that's this effect right here. So we have the dark water, we have the sky, and then we have this layer. We don't really know where the horizon is. It's somewhere in this band of this indistinct and blurred thing that looks like a fog bank coming across the sea. But it's definitely not sky, and water coming together in here anywhere distinctly. Now here are two images taken from Marquette of Lake Superior. The image on the right was taken in the afternoon and you notice that on a warm day with cold lake water we're getting a little bit of an inversion. Do you see the false horizon in the back? Now later on that evening from the exact same spot on Lake Superior we see a very clear horizon with no false horizon behind it. And the reason being is that the air temperature had cooled down somewhat to approach the lake temperature. Now the easiest way to understand how refraction occurs is to look at the behavior of light as it goes from the vacuum of space into the denser, thicker atmosphere of the Earth. Now to try and get a good handle on what refraction is in the atmosphere, we can have a look at three stars, A, B, and C. Now star A is directly overhead. We're looking straight through the atmosphere and space at the star and its position is not shifted in any way, shape, or form. If we look at star C, the light coming into the Earth from star C is actually bent downward by the atmosphere. And as a result, as the light plunges down to us, we try to follow it back and we see star C at where it's listed C prime. That's an illusion. Now an intermediate step would be star B, where you're not getting quite as much refraction. Now as a result, the illusion that we get, which is B prime, is not as far separated from the actual location of star B as, say, star C and C prime are. Again, star A being straight up has absolutely no effect of refraction. Taking this into account with determination of the size, the circumference, and the radius of the Earth. With Al Biruni, what he did was he measured the dip angle 
from the top of a mountain to the horizon. That acted very much like star C and C prime. It was bent and refracted by the atmosphere, and the result of that is a slight error. If you look at Eratosthenes, who was measuring the noonday sun, similar to star A, you will see refraction doesn't really come into play with that. So everyone, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Marquette, Michigan. Thank you for the opportunity to sit down and have a brief chat with you on the intricacies of refraction and diffraction. And I hope to see you again soon. Remember to hit that like and subscribe and take care.